Sure. <clears throat> Just got to press a couple of little buttons here. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our final spring 2024 Zoom speaker series presentation. My name is Ben Weiss. We are the Historical Society of Ottawa, and Jacob and I are your hosts tonight. Before we begin, please join me in acknowledging whose land it is upon which we gather tonight. For thousands of years before colonial times, the members of Indigenous communities traveled from far and wide to gather at the meeting of the three rivers, the Ottawa, the Gatineau and the Rideau, from the Chaudière Falls to the mouth of the Gatineau River. The area is rich in natural resources, plants, animals and fish, and also provided a convenient meeting place for trade and communication among communities. Of special significance are the burial place at Hull Landing and the Chaudière Falls, a sacred place for meeting and sharing and ceremonies. The burial grounds of the Ottawa Gatineau Corridor, including Hull Landing, were important for rituals of respect and bonding with the landscape. Victoria Island, located under the Portage Bridge, continues to provide the sacred space to local and visiting Indigenous people. The National Capital Region, which includes the City of Ottawa, remains unceded Algonquin Anishinaabeg territory. We encourage our members and our guests to reflect on this, our connected history, and ways we can contribute to reconciliation. Next, please let me extend our thanks to the City of Ottawa, the province of Ontario, and to our members. Without your continued support, none of what we do would be possible. If you are not yet a member of the Historical Society of Ottawa, we invite you to consider joining in order to support our work, our speaker series, our social media presence, our publications, our awards for students, and more. If you think you might be interested, I have posted the website on our chat page. At the Historical Society of Ottawa, we've been telling Ottawa's great stories for a, over a century and a quarter, including now through our twice monthly speaker series. As you know, we currently run two separate parallel speaker series. We bring our virtual presentations into the comfort of your home, as we are tonight on the second Wednesday of each month. In addition, we invite you to join us for our in-person presentations at the Ottawa Public Library Main Branch Auditorium on the fourth Saturday afternoon of every month. With our final presentation at the end of April, we are concluding our spring 2024 HSO speaker series, but have no fear, we'll be back in the fall with an exciting new lineup of talks. In the meantime, watch out for details on an exciting summer of special event programming. Keep an eye on our website and our Facebook page for details on planned events such as a bus excursion to Kittigan Zebe on June 1st for the annual powwow there, museum club events, and opportunities to participate in Chief Panessi Day on July 1st. So I began my introduction this evening with the important acknowledgement that we are on the land of the Algonquin people. Our, our virtual speakers presentation last September talked about Chief Panessi, whose family once occupied the lands where the capital stands today, and how the only non-Indigenous people Panessi would have seen as a young man would have been the occasional fur trader passing through. A lot of us have arrived since then. All of us immigrants of some kind, all of us seeking a new life, new life, and almost always seeking refuge from challenging circumstances in the homelands we left behind. There are currently 100 million displaced people in the world seeking a new country to call home, displaced often because of persecution, sometimes to escape severe economic or natural disaster. The flow of humankind is as old as humanity, and the continuing shifting of populations will doubtless be never ending. Some of you attended the first of our sold out three part lecture series with Phil Jenkins this month at the Sunnyside Library. The topic of Phil's lecture series is how immigration has shaped and enriched the fabric of our city over the years. For those of you who attended, what I have to say tonight will sound familiar. Our final in-person spring 2024 HSO speakers presentation will be held on Saturday, April 27th at the downtown library. And the subject will be the Karsh brothers to Armenian refugees who went on to enormous success as new Canadians. Our in-person presentation last September discussed how Gord Atkinson was instrumental in launching the amazing career of Paul Anka, his parents knew immigrants from Syria and Lebanon who ran a restaurant here in Ottawa. Our speaker series presentation in October was about Phyllis Turner, mother of future Prime Minister John Turner, a single mother who came to Ottawa from England in the 1930s looking for a better life for her children through tough economic times. Our latest pamphlet consists of the memoirs of a tradesman named Richard Lester, who ended up in Bytown with his eight children in 1857, 
having fled the desperate economy of East London at the time. Within the last couple of years, we've told the story of Project 4000 and the boat people of 1979, the Irish famine refugees of 1847, and the British home children who came to this country. Earlier this winter, James Powell and I had the opportunity to sit down with former Governor General Adrian Clarkson and ask about her experiences as a young Chinese Canadian girl growing up in Ottawa after her family had fled wartime Hong Kong. That story is in our latest newsletter and on our website. Last month's Zoom presentation featured Dave Tulak recounting the experience of immigrants from the Caribbean these last 50 years and the vibrant community that has resulted here in our city. What we see over and over is that new groups establish communities that arrive and thrive in our city. We all become richer for it. All of us are immigrants ourselves or our grandmothers or our grandfathers, facing the challenges of setting in a, settling in a new and strange land, making the best of the opportunities that lay in front of us and building the best future we can for ourselves and our families. My mother came to Canada as a Dutch war bride, grateful to leave behind the horrors she saw in wartime Europe. My father's parents were Jewish refugees who had fled adversity in Eastern Europe at the time and sought to start a new life in Canada coming and joining the growing Jewish communities in Montreal and later in Toronto. It was in the 1890s that my grandfather arrived in North America and soon set out to make his fortune, giving a try at assorted trades, whether it be running a grocery store or selling insurance. Tonight, David is gonna to talk about members of that same Jewish diaspora who chose to make a new life in Ottawa and the golden age of Jewish life that resulted here in the nation's capital during the first decades of the 20th century. But who laid the foundation for that golden age? Among the first was Moses Bilski. And I am so pleased to announce that introducing David this evening, we are honored to welcome Anna Bilski, great granddaughter of Ottawa's first Jewish settler, Moses Bilski. Before I hand things over to Anna, a reminder to everyone to please keep your settings on mute so as not to interfere with our speaker's presentations and turning off your video feed once we get going assists with the overall transmission as well. Tonight's presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. So during the presentation, please start typing your great questions into the chat box. What will happen is after David's presentation, I will read the questions to David. I will read any questions for Anna and that's how our Q&A will work. And so, with great pleasure, I hand things over to Anna Belsky, author of A Common Thread, A History of the Jews in Ottawa, and great-granddaughter of Moses Belsky, the man who started it all. Thank you very much, Ben. I hope everybody can hear me, and I hope I don't start coughing. Um, yes, I'm the great-granddaughter of Moses Belsky, and that's I guess my greatest claim to fame. Um, my great grandfather was quite an amazing man. Um, thank you for telling me or for or for saying that I am the author of the book, A Common Thread. I prefer to call myself the compiler, but I was a, an editor and I did a lot of editing uh, after everybody did their research. I'm very impressed that uh, David has uh, decided to do this topic and that David is a, an, an historian. When we tried to put the book together, it took a long, it took six years actually to put the book together. And I see that some of the people present were involved with me at that time. And I'm delighted to see that they're here. And um, uh, the, the, the book is, a, it was a trial. Uh, never do a book by committee. That's the only advice I will give you and trying to do a history from my perspective as, as a non-historian was remarkably difficult. And if you've seen the book, you'll see in, in my introduction, part of it is most of it, especially for Jewish people, is a lot of folklore. I grew up with all the stories of my great grandfather and his exploits and what he did. And it was pretty exciting to hear as a little kid. And I admire people like David who try to make sense out of history. I still am confused about the dates of some of the things that I've been told, but there it is. Um, so I guess I better, one of the things I just wanna, wanna say, which I find quite amusing, uh, David's title is Paupers, Peddlers, Purveyors and Parishioners. The working title of the book 
that we put together on the history of the Jews of Ottawa was originally, I can't remember the total title, but originally it was pioneers, peddlers, something else and politicians, maybe Lori can remember. Uh, it was an awful title. It was so difficult. We had all these little things printed and Lawrence Friedman, bless his soul, uh, managed to get uh, money from people I never would have expected. So we were very lucky. So regardless of the title, all things worked. Um, I think I better introduce David. You're here to listen to him, not to me. Um, David is a, a researcher at the historical firm of No History. I didn't know there was such a thing. I think that's wonderful that so many young people are so happy to study and and um, transmit all this wonderful information about our history. Uh, he's originally from Toronto, but he did his bachelor's degree at Carleton here in Ottawa. He did a master's in Dalhousie and a PhD at Queens. I won't hold it against him because I'm a McGill graduate. Um, in addition to his academic publications, he regularly writes for the Ottawa Citizen, the Historical Society of Ottawa, and the Ottawa Jewish Archives. He and his wife, Arshina, have a three-year-old son, and they live out in Finley Creek. So without further ado, please, it's my pleasure to welcome David C. Martin. Thank you so much, Anna, and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Ben, as well. Uh, while I'm thanking, I also have to thank Tegan Goldsmith from the Ottawa Jewish Archives for her assistance in the research. Um, today, I'm going to take you back to the beginnings of Ottawa's Jewish community. When doing research for this presentation, it immediately became clear to me that the creation of the community came about in two seemingly contradictory ways, one, one of which I'm calling adaptation and the other one I'm calling conservation. Initially, I thought that adaptation best described the economic and broad social activities of early migrants, while conservation described the religious and cultural practices, that that neatly divided dichotomy doesn't seem apt anymore. I now believe that the two forces or approaches to community building apply to the early communities' activities all around. Conservation was seen in their economic activities as much as adaptation was in their religious and cultural practices. And I hope that that seemingly contradictory, though actually complementary relationship will shine through as I go through my presentation today. So I think what we'll do is begin with a brief overview of what I'm calling the first golden age of Jewish life in Ottawa. And then we'll turn to a handful of individual personalities that I'd like to discuss. Uh, there we go. Uh, before finally shifting over to the institutions that were born during this period. The time period that I'm calling the first golden age begins roughly around 1880 and continues on to the outbreak of World War I. Its limits are somewhat unclear. I'm more certain with the era's start than its end. I think it's clear that by the 1930s, Jews in Canada and around the world were entering into a far darker time. And perhaps the 1920s represent a sort of transition period. Um, but it's not too important for our purposes, so we can just begin and see how far we can get through. In 1957, when Ottawa was made the nation's capital, it was most commonly defined as something like a grubby little lumber town, widely regarded as wild and turbulent, a village of, of Irish and French Canadian lumbermen far with far too much liquor. Uh, even by 1874, the city lacked running water, most of the city lacked running water. With a handful of exceptions, there really wasn't a Jewish community in Ottawa to speak of until I would say roughly the early 1880s. In 1881, there were about 20 self-identified Jews living in the city of 21,000. By 1914, that number had risen to about 3,000. So there was clearly a population boom in the say 30, 35 years between 1880 and the outbreak of World War I. The number grew at a relatively rapid pace, uh, reaching about 400 in 1891, 1776 in 1911, and for context, the city's population was about 43,000 in 91 and 90,000 by 1911. Those numbers might also be compared with the population of Jews in Canada. So it was 400 in Ottawa in 1891, and that compares to about 6,500 Jews living in Canada as a whole. In 1911, those numbers were again 1,776 in Ottawa, and that compares to about 75,000 Canada-wide. So suffice to say, even as their number grew exponentially in this period, 
Ottawa wasn't a major destination for Jewish immigrants to Canada. Jewish immigrants arriving in the country at the time, Ottawa included, were poor, often very poor. Of the 31 Jewish heads of household to arrive in Ottawa in the year 1900, only two claimed professional status, and we might describe those as teachers, nurses, or 15 were unskilled laborers working in the personal service, another 10 were self-employed or small businessmen, and the remainder are still unclear. The vast majority of Jewish migrants to the country during this period were what we'd likely call today refugees. In fact, most came from the Tsarist Russian Empire immediately after local pogroms. Hundreds struck Jewish communities in Imperial Russia during this period, and each time we can see a small uptick in emigration from Russia. A program, for those who might not know, was a violent, locally confined, often riot-like attack on a community's Jews. In these attacks, homes, businesses, and religious institutions were often ransacked and burned, and Jews were often assaulted and even murdered after being made scapegoats for some sort of regional problem or misfortune. For survivors of these attacks, at least for those who could manage, immigration became the best means of escape. Nearly half of the immigrants to arrive in Ottawa during this period did so without their families. Generally, a man made the voyage alone in the hopes of establishing a foothold in Canada before sending for his family. It was common for these men to spend two years or more saving up the funds needed to pay for their wives and children to join them in Ottawa. For those arriving in Canada, usually by way of the US, the most attractive destination was either Montreal or Toronto, where other Jews had already settled. Hopes of accessing a synagogue, uh, kosher food, which is food that meets the strict dietary laws of uh, observant Jews, a Jewish education, or even a Yiddish-speaking English tutor were far, far higher in Toronto or Montreal. In Ottawa, where again some 20 Jews lived in 1881, we might say that quite a lot of community building was still left to be done. There was, however, one draw that Ottawa offered over Montreal or Toronto, and surprisingly it was economic, We'll return to that in just a minute. As I mentioned, many of the era's Jewish migrants arrived from Europe with very little. In their home countries, especially in Eastern Europe and the Russian Empire, economic opportunity was severely restricted. In fact, the Russian Empire established what it called the Pale of Settlement, where Jews were forced to live, keeping them outside the major industrial and economic centers of the Russian Empire. Professional jobs were essentially off limits, as were most educational opportunities and work in the civil service. To survive in the Pale, many Jews scratched out a living as peddlers, a common occupation for the oft-marginalized Jews of Europe since the Middle Ages. Peddling usually involved the retail sale of wares or trade services and the purchase and reselling of agricultural produce by traveling salesmen of generally humble means. These men, they generally were men, would make regular short trips between clients, offering whatever they could manage to procure from local sources. Peddling was the most common occupation of Jews in the Pale, and indeed for Jewish migrants arriving in Canada. It's a little bit of the conservation of practice that I spoke about at the outset. So what was that economic opportunity that was offered in Ottawa over Montreal or Toronto? In Montreal, a peddler's license cost between $25 and $60 a year. In Toronto, between $2.50 and $30. And in early Ottawa, as little as $0.10 cents and as high as $9. And that the price depended on the nature of the peddling license, whether you were using a horse and buggy or were on foot, and the year that we're talking about. For those coming with essentially nothing, the cost differential could allow them to hit the ground running in a way that they simply couldn't do in Montreal or Toronto. Most of those who chose Ottawa also chose Lower Town, as it offered easy access to sellable goods like fresh produce. There, rents were low and customers in relatively close proximity to one another. In 1901, of the roughly 400 Jews living in Ottawa, 165 lived in the Byward Market and another 124 in the neighboring Ottawa Ward. Between Friday night and Saturday night, the Jewish Sabbath, observant Jews refrained from work, including commerce of any kind. So peddling was also an attractive option for many Jews as it allowed them to practice their faith as they were free to leave the streets or close down their stalls before sundown on Friday and didn't have to start up again until after the Sabbath had ended. The majority of peddlers in Ottawa focused on food items due to their low initial investment requirements. Nevertheless, a few gained reputations for specializing in various goods like raw furs, 
skinned hides, scrap metal, uh, secondhand furniture and clothing, and other, other options. Some earned reputations for offering high quality products or for especially fair pricing, and others established exclusive relationships with certain customers by adhering to specific routes. By 1939, approximately 43% of Ottawa's hawkers and peddlers were of Jewish descent. The original Jewish entrepreneurs were simple foot, pushcart, or knapsack peddlers who traveled the streets of Ottawa and its outskirts, hawking their wares door to door. Their success rested on making small gains while remaining adaptive to change and open to opportunity. A number of these walking peddlers were able to graduate to horse-drawn wagons and then small stalls and eventually even storefronts. I remember a funny anecdote that I once referenced in an article that I wrote for the Ottawa Jewish Archives. In 1982, while appealing for charity, the general chairman of the UJA, Jack Kranzberg, took a moment to refer, uh, reminisce about the youth that he spent in the Byward Market of the 1930s. A little later than the era that we're exploring, but still it's a useful mood setter. I have it here and I will read it verbatim. On Thursday, as we were walking along the market row, there were a couple of young kids standing behind their little wagons shouting, transfer lady, transfer lady. And my mother, whose English was terrible, asked me in Yiddish, who's trying to transfer lady? And I answered her in Yiddish, explaining they were not crying out Kranzberg lady, which was the family's last name. They're shouting transfer lady. My mother then asked me once again in Yiddish, who's mind is transfer lady? And I explained to her that these boys were equipped with their little wagons and were offering their services to help people carry their par parcels home for a small tip. My mother nodded her head and the following week there was a new wagon purchased for me, not to help with her parcels, but to find myself a spot in the market and begin earning my own way. So while I'm not sure that that does much for certain stereotypes around the Jewish mother, it does help set the scene. And we can now turn to exploring some of the interesting personalities uh, who were really the pioneers of the Ottawa Jewish community. We don't have time to look at every individual that I might like to present, so I tried to pick a handful whose impact in early community building was especially significant. Because of how small the population was, and because of the rate at which the population began to grow in the 1890s and early 1900s, there emerged a small number of individuals who really stepped up and took charge in building the early institutions that would sustain the growing population into the 20th century. These tended to be some of the earliest arrivals who had the opportunity to more firmly plant their roots in Ottawa before the population boom. First person is none other than Ms. Anna Bilski's grand, great-grandfather, Moses Bilski, about whom a lot has been written, but paradoxically not that much is actually known. Some of the more fanciful stories that have helped to build his legacy are based on family lore and are difficult to verify, but we can still say with certainty that his influence on Ottawa's early Jewish community was profound. Born in Kovno, Lithuania, December 10, 1829, Bilski was 14 when his widowed father, Eli, brought him to Montreal and then on to Kempville, Ontario. If we accept the family version of the story, Moses first arrived in Ottawa in 1857, though it's unclear how long he stayed. Regardless of when Moses arrived, either 1857 or not until 1878, when his name first appears in the Ottawa city directories, he was among the handful of Jews who arrived in Lumbertown before 1881, when the year's census recorded 20 Jews or less. We believe that Moses moved out west in 1861, pursuing the riches of the Caribou gold fields, though he quickly realized he wouldn't reap the riches and glory that he had hoped. On his return trip eastward, it said that he was recruited to undertake prospecting work in Central America. Once in Panama, he discovered, however, that he had been hired to participate in an illegal gun running operation intended to provide weapons for the overthrow of Emperor Maximilian of Mexico. Bilski immediately sought an escape and managed to have himself smuggled out of the country and back to San Francisco. As the story goes, Bilski next enlisted in the Union Army and was wounded April 14, 1865, during a riot that broke out following Lincoln's assassination. He then turned back to Canada, arriving in Mattawa, which is a flourishing, was a, a flourishing lumber town at the time, of about 100 souls. By 1867, Moses had indeed returned to Ottawa, building a home in Lower Town. According to his granddaughter, Anna Bilski, and Millie Bilski, Mirsky, excuse me, 
Moses then opened his first store, a jewelry store and pawn shop. Even afterward, he continued to be a wanderer, leaving from and then returning to Ottawa several times in the coming decades. While Moses Bilski may or may not have been the first permanent Jewish settler in Ottawa, he was nonetheless vital in the establishment and growth of the community. By the time he was married in 1874, it's clear that he had opened a jewelry store in Ottawa. And in 1885, his daughter Lillian was born, though that may have been outside of the city. As the community grew, it became imperative that someone with the skills needed to prepare kosher meat, called a shohet, or a ritual slaughterer, had to be found. Moses Bilski took the responsibility on with two other gentlemen, and in 1892 they traveled to New York, where they found one Reverend Jacob Mirsky, an ordained cantor, who agreed to accompany Bilski back to Ottawa. Moses and his wife Pauline always welcomed a steady stream of visitors to their home. Many of these were poor, newly arrived Jewish migrants, who Moses helped to adjust to life in Ottawa, often setting them as peddler, setting them up as peddlers, or in small stalls in the Byward Market. The equally industrious Pauline commonly rose at the crack of dawn to prepare meals and wash and mend clothes for her lodgers. The Bilskis also frequently conducted religious services on holy days out of their home, as Ottawa didn't yet have a synagogue. The esteem that the community held Moses in is evidenced by a front page article printed by the Ottawa citizen following his death on January 4th, uh, 4th 1923. At the age of 94, he described him as a man of sterling worth and honesty. It's also uh, a description that we can use to apply to our next individuals, Archie and Lillian Fryman. Archibald Jacob Fryman was born June 6, 1880, in Virbilis, Lithuania. He arrived in Hamilton at the age of 13, where he changed his name from Aharon Yaakov to Archibald Jacob. After attending school in Hamilton, he followed his father to Ottawa in 18, 1899, where together with Moses Kramer, he opened the Canada House Furnishing Company on Rideau Street. The following year, the store was enlarged to include street numbers 221 and 223, and in 1902, the business was moved up the street to number 73. In 1903, the partnership was dissolved as the older partner found the pace of expansion too great and the young Fryman's innovative ideas too bold. Into Kramer's shoes stepped Harris Fryman and the father and son duo continued the business at 73 Rito under a new firm name, H. Fryman and Son. The premises continued to expand under their stewardship until 1917, when Archie Fryman became the sole owner of the business, having bought out his father who went into retirement. From its founding until 1918, the store sold carpets, oil cloths, and other house furnishing, uh, furnishings, before Fryman decided to add departments for men and women. The business flourished in the years following and remained in the family until 1971, when it was sold to the Hudson Bay Company. The younger Fryman built extensive relationships with the city's Gentile majority, striking up friendships with some of Canada's greatest luminaries of the time, like Wilfrid Laurier, uh, William Lyne Mackenzie King, and the Governor General Lord Tweedsmer. Lillian Bilski, Moses' daughter and Anna's great aunt, met and married A.J. Fryman on August 18, 1903 in Montreal, having already helped to establish the Ottawa Jewish Women's Benevolent Society several years earlier. She continued her work in community charity, both Jewish and non-Jewish. In 1915, she joined forces with members of the ladies' auxiliaries of local synagogues to form the Women's League of Ottawa. During the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918, which struck some 10,000 inhabitants of Ottawa, she was placed in charge of the emergency at the behest of the city council and then Mayor Harold Fisher. Lillian Bilsky Fryman's work was repeatedly recognized and honored. In 1922, McLean's magazine ran a feature about her entitled Friend of the Needy and Lonesome. In 1934, her name appeared on King George V's New Year's list of honors as she was conferred the rank and decoration of Officer of the Order of the British Empire. The citation for her honor read, for the community work, service to return soldiers, and leadership in the Jewish charitable organizations of the country. According to Mackenzie King's journal, she was likely the first Jewish person so honored. Next up on my list of heavy hitters is John Dover, another remarkably influential Jewish resident in early Ottawa, who managed to find success despite having the humblest of beginnings. He arrived in North America in 1885 at the age of 16, landing in New York City from Urbrick, 
a small town in the outskirts of Kovno. Alongside Aaron Cohen, who later became his brother-in-law, the two young men launched a spoon business in New York, an unsuccessful venture that soon gave way to a career in peddling, which was an appealing prospect for any ambitious young man at the time. When the Canadian Atlantic Railway was being built, Dover decided the opportunity was too great to pass up, and he arrived in Canada where he sold pocket watches to railroaders. That venture soon brought him to Montreal and then to Ottawa. Once here, once here, his cousin Jacob persuaded him to take up dry goods, and over a period of some months, John operated between Ottawa and nearby Metcalfe, Ontario. In 1885, Jacob, who was still peddling watches and jewelry, joined John, and the two set out for Port Arthur, which is today Thunder Bay, via Chicago, Minneapolis, and Winnipeg. After traveling about the U.S. and Canada for some time, in 1888, John returned to New York to marry Minnie Cohen, his childhood sweetheart, and the two then moved back to the Ottawa region, this time permanently. According to Dover family papers, after returning to Ottawa, John Dover found that there were three reformed Jews, Aaron Rosenthal, a Mr. Teichman, and a Mr. Marx, but that he was the only Orthodox Jew. By this time, Moses Bilski had moved to Montreal, and so John can be given the honor of being the first Orthodox Jew to permanently settle in Ottawa. Appearing in the Ottawa City Directory first in 1890-91, Dover moved around the city multiple times before settling in the Byward Market area by 19, uh, 1897, where he worked as a peddler, and then a wholesale butcher, a produce vendor, and finally a wholesale producer and commission merchant. No sooner did he settle in the nation's capital than did John begin holding religious services in his home for his family and the handful of other Jewish families living in Ottawa. When the first synagogue was finally built, he had become he became a leading member. John Dover and his wife welcomed their first child, Harry, in 1890, who it appears was likely the first Jewish child born in Ottawa. Harry Dover, himself a great success story, grew up to attend McGill University, winning the, the Sutherland Gold Medal and graduating with an MD in 1914. He interned at the Carleton County General Protestant Hospital before leaving for New York City, where he was a senior intern at the celebrated Women's Hospital and then resident obstetrician at the Harlem Hospital. Following his return to Ottawa, Harry enlisted in the Canadian Army Medical Corps as a captain and remained enlisted until after the First World War's end in 1918. He then, he then opened a practice in Ottawa, becoming the first Jewish doctor to practice in the city and eventually the first Jewish coroner in Canada. John and Minnie Dover's other four sons all followed in their father's example and entered the merchandising game. Joseph became a Spark Street hardware merchant, Meyer a salesman with Capital Tire Sales, John with Imperial Tire, and David a wholesale tobaccoist. Now, if you recall, I mentioned that Moses Bilski once went out on an 1892 trip to New York in search of a clergyman as part of the three-man committee. That committee also included John Dover, and that endeavor ended successfully when one Jacob Mirsky, an ordained cantor, was persuaded to relocate to Ottawa. He will be our next individual. Born in Minsk in 1859, he spent his youth studying Talmud to become a cantor, which is a liturgical singer and prayer leader. He entered a Jewish seminary in New York in 1892, where he was found by Bilsky, Dover, and an unknown third man, and then brought back to Ottawa. Jacob Mirsky was described as a bridge between the small established Jewish community and the newer migrants arriving in larger numbers by the turn of the 20th century. Before the establishment of mutual benefit societies, he was, according to one text, the social service and charitable arm of the Jewish community. After settling in Ottawa, Mirsky brought over his wife and four children from Russia, having his last child, Sam, in Canada. Mirsky's wife died shortly after his birth, and Jacob remarried a Devorah Nathanson of New York brought her youngest son, Joe Nathanson, with her to Ottawa, leaving her other three children with relatives in New York, as her husband's salary simply would not support so many children. Upon his death on April 29, 1942, Jacob Mirsky was survived by two sons, David Mirsky of Ottawa and Major Sam Mirsky, then serving overseas, and two daughters, Mrs. Robert Glass of New York and Mrs. Mendel Perlman of Ottawa. Last person on our list of personalities that I'd like to look at is Casper Kaplan, whose rags to riches story epitomizes the chance for success that Ottawa granted its earliest Jewish arrivals, something that was almost unimaginable for them in the former Russian Empire. 
Kasper Kaplan, a Lithuanian-born Jewish immigrant, began his life in Ottawa as a peddler, like so many others. Arriving in 1892 with just 63 cents in his pocket, Kaplan launched his career as a salesman using a horse and buggy to sell small wares. Often forced to use the barter system given the worldwide economic climate at the time, he exchanged merchandise for dairy and other farm and garden produce, which he subsequently sold to city folk. In 1897, he married Dora Rostin of Montreal, and that same year he opened his first store on Rideau Street, moving it two years later to Le Breton Flats. Went the wrong way. In 1900, he lost his store in the Great Ottawa Hall Fire of 1900, that consumed so much of the city. With a family to feed, Kaplan again began peddling door to door for another five years, during which time he accumulated enough capital to open another store, this time at 491 Sussex. Called Ottawa and Hall Furnishings, it sold men's and women's clothing on the main floor and linoleum in the basement. It also had living quarters on the second and third floors. Growing larger, the store eventually moved to grander quarters on Sussex and added a furniture department, eventually becoming a full-fledged department store, C. Kaplan Limited, which specialized in furniture and apparel. Moved again, this time over to Rideau Street in 1916. Over the coming years, the store expanded several times, eventually becoming one of the city's largest department store, and it continued to operate under Kaplan's son's stewardship until it finally closed for good in 1890, uh, sorry, 1984. Before moving on to look at some of the community's earliest institutions, I feel it's important to note that these individuals were generally exceptional. Not all Jewish peddlers became wealthy department store owners or wholesale merchants. Many more failed than succeeded. If you look at the early Ottawa business directories, it's clear that many of the businesses, Jewish owned and otherwise, that appeared in any one year didn't appear the following year, suggesting their failure. It's also true that while many of the era's migrants took up peddling, there were also quite a few that didn't. About a third of the Jews arriving from Tsarist Russia in the period worked in the clothing trade, skills that they brought with them to their new homes. Many of these migrants maintained their trade in Ottawa, operating home-based tailoring services. As with peddlers, some of these entrepreneurs would go on to own modest production and retail outlets, of which a very small number attained great success, while the majority managed to earn just enough to survive and were kept going by dreams of their children's eventual successes. Let's move on now to look at some of the institutions that these individuals and many other early Jewish residents of Ottawa built to sustain the early community as it expanded in the 1880s, 90s, and into the 20th century. The primary institution of Jewish life in any community is a synagogue or shul. The word synagogue comes from the Greek word for assembly and shul in Yiddish from the German word for school. In Ottawa, when the first congregations were being assembled, the community was very much still in an insipid state, so much so that the meeting minutes of Ottawa's very first official synagogue, Adas Sharun, notes that if the community dwindles and the very last Jewish member wishes to leave the city, he must take the Torah and minute book and place it for safekeeping in an Orthodox synagogue in Montreal. They were optimistic, though, noting in the same entry that it was to be kept in Montreal for an eventual Ottawa congregation. The first synagogues to operate in Ottawa were all Orthodox. There wasn't a conservative shul, I believe, until 1938, nor a reform congregation until 1966. Not just a place for worship, the shul was also a school and a social and cultural center where Jewish life could be sustained. Once established, it meant that newcomers had a place to go, a place of sociocultural security and of psychological safety. As I mentioned, the very first shul was Adasya Sharun, The first formal meeting of the congregation was held March 14, 1892. That date is probably not coincidental, as like the Jews of Susa, or Sushan, capital of the Persian Empire, Ottawa's Jews too lived in a capital. Since the Jews of Susa celebrated their Purim deliverance from Haman on March 14, Ottawa Jews likely believed this to be a particular date that would portend good fortune. The synagogue's first building was a small structure on 260, at 264 Murray Street and was acquired in 1895. In 1898, the Board of Control of the City of Ottawa recognized the building as a place of worship and recommended the remission of city taxes. The location, however, was less than ideal as its neighbor just happened to be a food processor 
whose staple pro, uh, product was pork and beans. As you might imagine, an Orthodox synagogue that consistently smelled of pork was probably not all that comfortable for worshipers. This, along with the ever-growing Jewish population, persuaded the congregation's leaders to plan for a larger building at a new location. They purchased a property at 375 King Edward Avenue and constructed a building designed by well-known architect John W.H. Watts, who also designed the Fleck Patterson House, which currently serves as the Algerian Embassy, and Booth House, a prominent heritage building on Metcalf. The new building completed in 1904 featured two onion-shaped domes in the style of Eastern European synagogues and is still standing today. Though not as a synagogue, I believe it's currently the Ottawa French Seventh Adventist Church. Uh, the cornerstone of the new building was laid July 25th, 1904 by Aaron Rosenthal and was completed with the financial assistance of two no well-known Ottawa Gentiles, lumber barons William Cameron Edwards and John Rudolphus Booth. Opening day of the new home of Adatia Sharoon on King Edward was the 14th of December in 1904, and in attendance for the ceremony that day were several dignitaries, including then Ottawa Mayor James Ellis. The second enduring Orthodox congregation, Agudath Achim, popularly, uh, popularly known as the Rideau Street Synagogue, was established just after the turn of the 20th century in 1902. Originally located in a converted double house on Rideau, it was home to about 25 families who had left Agudath Yesharun to found and join a new congregation. A 1914 Ottawa Journal article puts the reason for the split down to the growth of the Jewish community, which the small shul at 264 Murray Street was simply too small to accommodate. On August 12, 1902, the cornerstone was laid for a permanent brick building to be erected adjacent to the temporary one. The service was led by Reverend J. Lewis Doctor, who served as the congregation's cantor from 1902 to 1934. The building was replaced in 1912 by a new and larger one designed by the firm Burgess and Coils at 415 Rideau Street. Despite their relative proximity, Adas Yasharun and Agudath Achim managed to thrive competitively until they merged in 1956 to become Congregation Beth Shalom, which itself merged uh, with a West End congregation formed in 1936 called Agudat Israel, in order to form the current Kehilat Beth Israel in 2016. Another very early congregation, one that endure, endures independently to this day, is Machziki Hadas, Holders of the Faith. This congregation traces its origins to 1906, when a small number of worshippers met to pray in a Murray Street apartment. For their high holiday services, the group rented a hall at the corner of Dalhousie and St. Patrick's. Their first uh, permanent premises was a soft drink factory located on the south side of Murray Street between King Edward and Nelson Avenues that was financed by no more than 15 to 20 families and was described as being very small with a low ceiling and a leaky roof. It was known affectionately as the shul for peddlers. That synagogue was a first... Uh, Excuse me, the synagogue was officially incorporated in 1919. Its original charter provided for conducting worship according to the Orthodox ritual and the imparting of Hebrew and religious instruction to Jewish children. In 1973, the congregation moved to its current location on Virginia Drive in the Alta Vista neighborhood. In addition to the synagogue, other institutions were also needed as the community grew during its first golden age. One such institution was a cemetery. Jewish law is very strict and precise when it comes to burials, and from its earliest beginnings, the community simply didn't have the infrastructure necessary to bury community members who passed away. Before the founding of the local cemetery, it had been the practice to send Jewish bodies to Montreal for a proper burial. On at least one occasion, we know that this practice was not observed. When a Romanian Jewish boy who had been working in the lumber mills died one night, he was buried in a Catholic cemetery by way of a kind gesture undertaken by his boss at the time, who didn't understand Jewish burial custom. Almost immediately after its founding, Adas Yasharun, the city's first synagogue, began the process of finding an appropriate place to establish a Jewish cemetery in Ottawa. The committee of three, headed by John Dover, was appointed by Adas Yasharun to scout potential properties around the city. Dover eventually found an acre of land owned by one Mr. James Spratt of the famous Spratt family. John explained that as a poor, small congregation, they were limited in the amount of money that they could pay for the land, and the two agreed upon the relatively modest sum of $100 in 1892. 
Today, the cemetery on Bank Street, just south of Hunt Club, occupies about 14 acres. Among the first burials at the new site was that young Romanian boy, whose remains were reburied according to Jewish custom in their final resting place. Another small cemetery was founded at Bowesville by a group of Ottawa Jews known as the Society of the Sons of Jacob. Purchased perhaps as early as 1886, a great deal of mystery surrounds this site's early history, but it was eventually sold to Adas Yesharu. In 1958, the land at Bowesville was sold by the congregation to the Crown, likely under pressure from the NCC, which sought to develop the area's highways as the city grew. Those few individuals buried at Bowesville were disinterred and reburied at the Bank Street location. For 14 years, the Bank Street Cemetery was owned and operated solely by Adas Yesharu. As other synagogues continued to grow, they joined with the city's very first congregation to purchase adjacent lands and expand the cemetery. Another prominent institution to emerge during the era, or I guess institutions, were the benevolent societies. As we already know, the growing number of immigrants arriving to Ottawa in this period were generally impoverished. While small informal bodies of the Jewish community tried their best to tend to the needs of the poor and often traumatized new arrivals, they quickly found themselves overwhelmed. In the earliest days, many of Ottawa's Jewish pioneers faced significant financial hurdles. These often destitute late 19th and early 20th century immigrants, together with the city's handful of better established Jewish families, came together to meet the social welfare needs of their community. While Ottawa did provide refuge from pogroms, significantly improved living conditions, and no compulsory military conscription, not at least until 1917, any idea of government welfare support was still years away, and when hardship hit a family, it could prove catastrophic. The Ottawa Ladies Hebrew Benevolent Society, founded in 1897 by, among others, Bertha Rosenthal, who served as OLHBS president until her death in 1922, brought significant change. In the organization's own words, it was founded to, quote, care for the sick and needy Jewish families of the community, and to do other social work, such as finding employment for those women who must support themselves and generally giving a helping hand to Jewish people, having none of their own kin to help them. A few years later, its counterpart, the Ottawa Men's Hebrew Benevolent Society, was begun by Aaron Rosenthal and Moses Bilski. Together, the two organizations did their best to care for the city's Jewish poor, assisting the indigent as they reestablished themselves in their new hometown. Often providing sustained support to help many meet their basic needs, these institutions continue to provide an imperative lifeline to the community well into the 20th century. By 1932, the two separate societies joined together to form the Ottawa Hebrew Benevolent Society, which continued the good works of years gone by, caring for the sick and needy of Ottawa's still growing Jewish population. These institutions lasted in total 83 years, adapting to the changing needs of the community along the way. The very last institution, given the time that I will discuss, is the Hebrew school. Essentially non-existent in 19th century Canada, as children were required by law to attend public schools, the community had to arrange to provide religious instruction outside of regular secular hours. Financial constraints meant that receiving a religious education in the evenings or on weekends was especially difficult for new arrivals would often have their children assist with work during their off hours in order to meet the family's basic needs. In 1903, when the city's Jewish population was still likely under 500, Ottawa's first Jewish schools were established. One was located in the vestry room of the Rideau Street Synagogue. That was directed by Eliyahu Slonemski. Uh, Another in the King Edward Synagogue's vestry room was run by A.L. Levine. The curricula at these schools generally started out as modest, and tutors would offer regular sessions trying to adapt as best they could to the needs of their community. The community ran these small synagogue-based schools separately until 1919, when a newly created umbrella group called Ottawa United Talmud Torah purchased the George Street Public School. Beginning the next year, the group offered regular streamlined evening and weekend classes under the leadership of one of our old friends, Caspar Kaplan. The school's subject matter included Torah and Talmud study, but also Jewish history, Hebrew, Yiddish, and Jewish culture and customs. With that, I'm going to end for the evening, and thank you all very much for being here.
Um, I hope I didn't bore you too severely. And then if there are any questions, I'm happy to go to Q&A with Anna. Well, I think I can speak on behalf of the whole group that you did not bore us at all. That was a very lively and thorough and fascinating look at Ottawa's Jewish history, uh, the people, the places, the institutions. <clears throat> I guess I'm going to start with a question for you, David, and that is, you know, we look at the various diaspora within Canada, within Ottawa, and, and we see some groups, ethnic, national, religious groups that remain a community, some that retain that for generations. What, what do you think are the attributes of a, a group that remains a community through all these generations? What, what, what keeps a community together? What keeps a community strong? In the case of the Jewish community, there's, I mean, I think that the Jewish people are sort of lucky to be lucky and unlucky, I guess, to be an ethnicity, but also a culture and a religion. So mm -hmm. depending on the extent of your adherence to the religious aspect, you're still really involved in the community in ways of culture or education or familial links and kin. Um, so there's lots of ways to sustain a connection to the Jewish community, even for those who may not be religious. For other communities, I don't know that that, that same uh, opportunity exists, although I know that a lot of genealogical links, familial links, links to the old country, depending on where you are, um, seem to sustain a lot of communities in Canada. And tell me about the entrepreneurial thread that's throughout the, the, the Jewish culture and within the Jewish communities everywhere. So the, the entrepreneurial thread actually comes by way of persecution, it appears, um, in Europe where basically Jews were kept out of, I believe I mentioned they were kept out of the civil service. They were kept out of most educational institutions, universities, um, depending on where in Europe you're talking about and when. Between the various laws passed and expulsions and all these sorts of things, they sort of had to resort to self-help. And so entrepreneurship was really the the best way to go about doing that. Um, they often had to, I mean, in the shtetls in Eastern Europe, they would mostly buy and sell from one another in their larger communities. But in the smaller communities, they had to interact with non-Jews and they managed to do so pretty well. And that was certainly the case in, in early Ottawa. So I, I do have one question, and, and David, I, th I think your youth is coming through. You, you pronounce the family name Freeman, and I think the rest of it call it Freeman. And, yeah. A lot of us have fond memories of, of the, the Freeman uh, department stores and the Freemark department stores. Is there something you know that we don't, or is that no, just you? No, no, just the spelling. <laughs> <laughs> just the spelling. I spoke with Anna about that already, so yeah. <laughs> got to drill it in, right? There you go. Anna, how did it feel listening to uh, David's presentation tonight? Any thoughts that have come to your mind through all of this? Well, it's, it's always very interesting but it, uh, to hear how other people uh, see things and how they look at things. I think some of the dates are a bit odd. I think dates to me when it comes to when somebody went anywhere, I, I find them almost mysterious. So I... I, I there are no written records to say this is exactly the date that this happened when so-and-so did such and such. And uh, I think there's some really interesting connections. One, one of the things, just as an aside, you have uh, somebody coming to talk about the Karsh brothers. Yes. And of course, Karsh was the photographer in Ottawa when my parents got married in 1942. So he was the photographer who took their wedding photographs. And oh, that's fantastic because that was just before his career took off after that's taking right, a he was, with Winston Churchill. Yeah, he was the best photographer. So that's who that's Aunt Dorothy. I mean, if you talk about the Freemans, Dorothy, who was Lillian and Archie's, he was always called Uncle Archie. And uh, it, their oldest child was Dorothy. My father and my uncle were brought up by the Freemans. My, so my, my mother did did not have a mother-in-law and so Dorothy was the one who was considered the mother-in-law and in in the family 
she was referred to as the Duchess. And uh, I always called her Aunt Dorothy, even though she was my father's cousin and therefore my cousin. And when my father died and I was about 23 and she said, well, and I think you should now call me Cousin Dorothy. And I immediately said, yes, Aunt Dorothy. <laughs> you, can't, you can't change a lifetime. of That's the way it is. So, yeah. So speaking of years and chronology, Mac Fing Max Finkelstein, who is who's, who's a keen on everything that has to do with canoes, um, asked an interesting question. 1861, if, if in fact Moses Bilski did travel out west, Max was wondering how exactly did he do that? Now, he, if he was traveling through Canada, there were probably some canoes involved, but it's also quite likely that he deked into the States and took the trains that were already established there. I would imagine so. <laughs> It's difficult to say again with a lot with Moses Bilski is based on folklore, family yeah. lore. Um, and I haven't been able at least to find records to confirm that earlier date. Doesn't mean yeah. it's not accurate, but Who so I, I do not know how he would have managed to get there. <laughs> so John John Leaf asked asked an interesting question. I think I can answer this. John Leaf has asked uh, where was the Kaplan store? What has happened to it? Well, it was at um, 90, uh, 90 George Street or 125, 139 Rito Street. Uh, the building is now a 19-story residential tower with Urban Outfitters as a storefront. <laughs> but the original Kaplan's storefront uh, as a facade has been recreated, as, as have many in the downtown core. And again, this is the work of Barry Podolsky, who's done a lot of that stuff. So, John, that's that's where the Kaplan store is now. It's, it's an... Um, 13, 19th story residential tower, urban outfitters at the storefront, but the original Kaplan's uh, facade is still there. Did you know, just as an aside, that there's a, a marriage relationship between the Freemans and the Kaplan's? No. Yeah. You Gordon, started rumors here? Gordon and Kaplan <laughs> married, married Anna Epstein, and Anna Epstein was Archie Freeman's cousin. Ah. So I always grew up with them as Mishpacha and Aunt Ed and Uncle Gordon. <laughs> Keep it and then, of course, there were the Weinbergs. Ah, uh, the Weinbergs. Yeah, I didn't the know Weinbergs that. bought yeah. Larocs. So yeah. Larocs was established as a, a, a by by a French Canadian as a store to cater to the French Canadian clientele. The Weinbergs, I believe, they came out of Montreal, uh, took over Larocs when when Laroc uh, his his business failed, and and saw the virtue in continuing to keep it as a as a store serving. French Canadians and employing French Canadians. So there was another uh, Jewish, uh, de semi Jewish department store in Rideau Street. Yeah. And Lillian Kaplan married a Weinberg. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, <clears throat> Jacob, I'm going to get you to unmute Jaime Reichstein. I believe he uh, had something he wanted to talk about. Yes, yeah, sure. Jaime, uh, we're going to just give you a second here. Okay, one moment. Yeah, okay, I'm unmuted. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, there you go. Just to uh, update things, in the early days, uh, the synagogues ran their particular sections in both Bank Street and Osgood. Bank Street was the first Jewish cemetery, and then Osgood came in 19, I think, 76. Uh, today, uh, an organization by the name of Jewish Memorial Gardens bought all of the plots from all of the synagogues and run the two cemeteries for the, the Jewish community. Essentially, the synagogues still have what's called halachic control over their particular sections that they previously owned. In other words, they have, they have a Jewish... Um, um, I'm not sure what the English word is for halachic um, legal. Well, rule they have they they have rule over who can be buried in their particular section if they qualify as being fully Jewish, et cetera, et cetera, and the rules of burial. In other words, uh, say for uh, KBI Kehilat Bet Yisrael. Um, in their sections that they previously owned, the present synagogue has control over the rules in their sections. Uh, the other thing is schools. Um, I, you, you, ha, you know, eventually, Hillel Academy became the uh, 
the main uh, day school in Ottawa. And uh, then uh, there was a high school built called Yitzhak Rabin, which uh, subsequently failed. Uh, 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 in addition to that, there was another high school, which was a yeshiva high school uh, called Ottawa Torah Institute, which also failed. One of the problems within the Jewish community is that because it's a very small Jewish community and because... Um, uh, for instance, for Ottawa Torah Institute, many Jews are not interested in that level of learning uh, the Jewish uh, rules and regulations and Talmud, etc. Uh, it failed as well. Today, there are two schools, basically OJCS, the Ottawa Jewish Community School, which is the main day school, and Torah Day School, which is a more observant type school. Uh, uh, public school at, at K to K to nine or K to eight. Sorry, I mean just as a background, do you want to mention the project that you've been involved with? Um, well, John Diener and I—I I think John's on somewhere. I saw his name before. Uh, John Diener and I um, were involved originally in a project. We were both um, in the uh, Ottawa Jewish Genealogical Society. And we came up with a project to film a major cemetery in Chernivtsi, Ukraine. Um, and we we bought all the uh, we bought the, the digital cameras required and the computers required to take the pictures, store them on a hard drive, and then come back. We took fifty thousand pictures. So when we got when when the cameras came back and the computers came back, John and I decided to film the Ottawa Jewish cemeteries. So we filmed Bank Street first, every Jewish grave, and we filmed uh, Osgood as well, and we eventually put it online. We databased them and we put them online, and they're available at Jewish Gin, which is the uh, main world jewish genealogical website so if you want to know where anybody in the ottawa jewish uh, cemeteries are buried you can go to uh, jewishmemorialgardens.org and uh, click on the link that says find a grave and you could find anybody's grave in those jewish cemeteries well thank you so much jaime um so we have another question this one's from janet berkman and Janet says her grandparents were in the needle fur trade in Ottawa in the early part of the 20th century. And Janet is wondering if there are any resources, um, David, that you could recommend for further research. The family named Berkman uh, worked for American Taylor Company. Grandma Vera worked for a number of fur sellers on Rideau. Are you asking me? Yeah, no, David, I'm asking David, yeah. David, do you have any suggestions on that? Did you want me to repeat the question? I'm sorry. I, I, I would ask you, actually, you're the resident genealogical expert. Well, there are a lot of resources. One of the great resources is uh, a website called newspaper.com. It, always... it's, it's a pay site, but you can look up the Ottawa Citizen and the Ottawa Journal from its beginning using any name, any word, and you could quantify it by uh, dates or period dates, uh, et cetera. So that's probably one of the good historical places to go. Um, Jewish Jan, uh, other than looking up particular people who you may be looking for, uh, that's a good place to go because you can find anybody who's buried in the cemetery. That's jewishgen.org, G-E-N, right? Yeah, jewishgen, G-E-N dot org, yeah. Hey, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have another comment here from, from Karen Pritula uh, asking us, did we know that the late Kent Leonard Cohen's grandfather and great-grandparents first lived in Lanark County in the hamlet of Maberly in the mid to late 1800s before moving to Montreal? And uh, Karen points out that she'll be giving a, a, a demonstration um, I just lost it here for the Lanark. Where am I losing it here? 
for the Lanark County Geneolo Genealogical Society in October. So that's kind of interesting. That is very interesting. Yeah. And I did not know that. I did not know that either. Well, I had a, I actually had a connection to Leonard Cohn. Uh, the school. Of course you did. The, <laughs> I, I, I don't mean that DNA wise, but um, the school I went to in Montreal called Herzliya High School. Uh, the uh, basically the person who taught us literature, grammar, etc., was Irving Layton, one of Canada's great poets. And he and Leonard Cohn, Leonard Cohn was a disciple of his. And uh, many times uh, we would uh, get together, uh, our class was all of six. So we would get together with Leighton and go visit poets and writers and stuff like that. That was part of our literature class. And so we met uh, Leonard many, many times. So another question we have, David, is from Christine uh, Matamoros. As Jewish family arrived from various regions of Europe, could they communicate amongst themselves in Yiddish? Did, would they all have spoken this common language? That was most common, yeah, especially if they came from Eastern Europe and the Russian Empire. They definitely, mm -hmm. primarily English, uh, Yiddish speaking. And um, can you shed any light on, uh, this is coming from Paul Bennett, can you shed any light on the history and the role of the Jewish Community Center and when it might have been found, founded? That I don't believe was founded until much later after World War II. Right. Uh, could be corrected, but outside of the scope of what I was calling the first golden age. So I didn't go into that. I didn't go into Vat Hayir, um, which is the sort of umbrella Jewish Federation organization. Uh, those all those all came later in the in the community's development. Okay. Um that I think I'm up to date on the questions. Um, I'll just ask David, Anna, did you have anything further that you'd like to add this evening? I would just thank Anna for being here. It was definitely a treat to have her join us. Thank you very much. Uh, when you ask about the community center, I remember the community center when I was a little kid, because when they built Beth Shalom, they built the community center beside it. And so I was forced forced to go to the community center every Sunday afternoon where we got to watch movies and there was snacks and stuff. My major memory of that was I was eating toffee and my tooth came out in my toffee. So that's my major memory of going to the community center. <laughs> they had a, well, a lovely little library there too. And it was um, Louis Rasminski's wife, uh, Lila Rasminski, who started the library in there. That was the first Jewish library they had. Well, John Diener has kindly put in the, the comment that the original community center at the corner of Rideau and Chapel opened in the mid-1950s. And what an interesting location, because the reason it's called Chapel Street is that at Rideau and Chapel was Colonel Bayer's original chapel. <laughs> so <laughs> different groups have, 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 have participated on that same corner. And I went to Hader at the condemned school on Rideau Street, just up from Chapel. Was it condemned when you were a student there? Oh, yeah, it was a terrible building. Uh, <laughs> terrible building. <laughs> we survived. <laughs> well, I would like to thank David and Anna and everybody else who's contributed this evening. And it's been such an interesting evening, such a fascinating evening. Thank you, Jacob, as always, for your for your technical mm -hmm. steer, steerage here, steering uh, guidance. <laughs> and... Uh, we will have a great roster of Zoom presentations ready to go in September. Our very final um, speaker, in-person speaker series, of course, is featuring Paul Kuvret talking about the Karsh Brothers. That'll be at the Ottawa Public Library Main Branch Auditorium on April 27th, a Saturday afternoon. And thank you, everybody, and have a terrific evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Um, am I still on? <laughs>